returns. So we had introduced the rewards, right, and the returns. Um, and that was one central element of our reinforcement learning optimization loop with the agent and the environment. But of course, that's only one of the items from this loop. And we want to discuss the other items of the loop also more closely now. Another point which we saw in the loop is the state, right? So the state is the information describing the status of the environment. And we will differentiate between the environment state and on the next slide, the agent state. In the environment state, we will consider that this is also a random variable. Random variables in our case, we consider always like capital letters with potential realizations X, uh, e, so as a small letter. And this environment state is basically indicating all information which we need in order to describe the status of the environment to its full extent. So for example, that could be physical states like car velocity or motor currents in an electrical vehicle. That could be game states like a current chessboard situation or financial states like the stock market status. So that's nothing like a, a state uh, reduced to the definition of what you know from control engineering maybe, but like a state in a more general kind of context, like really everything which we need in order to describe the system. Uh, in terms of the agent, this state might be fully visible or not. So this is this uh, thing which we have seen with the observations, that there might be some measurements, f, from the state space to the measurement space, which I've called here uh, as y of k, which basically presents the measurements to the agents regarding the state, which could be a one-to-one -one mapping in the most simple case, but that could be also a limited viewpoint of the states where maybe some of the states are hidden to the agent. Potentially, there might be also some um, measurement noise or something like that if we have a technical system. In a game, of course, um, if you have like a classical Atari game where you have the entire frame of the game available as information, of course, this information would be quite complete because normally the entire frame of the game will give you all the information to describe the current gameplay situation. Um, that would be a full state information. If we have our car problem again and your sensor fails and the velocity is not measured in anymore, of course, then the entire state information would be not become available to the agent anymore. And the state itself can be a continuous or discrete quantity. We will first consider only discrete quantities, starting from next week especially. Discrete means that we have a finite state space. So we have a finite number of states in our set of states which we consider. So for example, if you have a chess board, we have like, what is it, like uh, eight times eight, I think, uh, elements on the chess board with potential positions of the chess elements of this chess board. So this would be a finite set state problem because you only have a finite number of iterations how the set pieces can be aligned to the limited number of chess positions. In a physical world, of course, if you're considering physical quantities like speeds, velocities, and so on, these numbers are, of course, normally continuous in contrast. Then we have the agent state, which is basically more or less the same in terms of a state, but now from the viewpoint of the agent. So the agent state is basically describing everything which the agent knows, either from the environmental point of view, but also in that sense that the agent might also have additional memory sources itself. So for example, if um, the agent has a controller policy, a decision policy, which is not only depending on its current situation, but also on the past decisions, which might be taken into account, then of course the agent has also an internal state, memory, which is the previous decision which the agent made and therefore the state space of the agent is different from the state space of the environment. Okay, so we have the environment view and we have the agent view. Normally, uh, it's not 
identical, as I said, for example, due to measurement noise or additional agents' memories. It is condensing all the information relevant for the next actions, and it depends on the internal knowledge and policy representation of the agent. It can be also a continuous and discrete quantity, and we will consider both starting with discrete quantities and then continue with continuous quantities, which are a little bit more hard to be handled. With respect to state, so state means we save information about the status of our environment and agent. We can also define a very important property of our state space, and this is the so-called history. The history is basically the sequence of all observations which the agent receives. So observation Y at the zero time step, reward at the zero time step, and action at the zero time step, up to our current time step. So this is called the history. So this is just a formal definition. We just take all the past data which we have obtained from the environment, put it into an array, and we call this history. And now comes the important definition with respect to the state. If we have a so-called information state, also called Markov state, then the interesting thing is that we do not need to really save this entire history because an information state basically says that the state transition from xk, so I'm currently in this state, at my current state xk, to the state xk plus 1, so towards the successor state, that this state transition probability only depends on xk, so on, on my current state information, and does not depend on further states which are lying in the past. Right? So this identity basically tells us, if I know my current state, this is condensing all the information about the environment or of the agent, which I need to know, in order to describe what will happen next, and all the other past information which we might have in the history is irrelevant. And this is a very important kind of um, definition or an important kind of property because it basically tells us if we have an environment and decision-making problem which state information can be considered an information or Markov state, then I can make my current decision just based on the current state. I do not need to take into account the entire past, and that is important because I do not need to save it. I can just throw away this information once it's past data, which is very nice because this will uh, reduce complexity of algorithms and so on. So information state or Markov state is therefore a very important concept, and I hope from this definition it becomes clear. Past information becomes not required because everything is condensed in the current state. What I ex there's a question is. Yes? It is not always a Markov state. Um, it depends on the problem, right? It depends on the problem. And also, from the agent point of view, if the agent is able to obtain all information. So, um, for example, um, if I would be a car and basically drive through this, through this room, and you would only be able to measure my, my speed in the two-dimensional plane here, right? So, if you know my starting point, and you know my speed over time, you can backtrack my current position, which would be also a state information, right? If you directly measure both my speed and my position, you do not need to know the previous speed information anymore because you have both already, my position and my speed through the space, right? So it really depends on the application and it depends on the information the agent has available from this application. And it's a very good question, but the answer, unfortunately, is somehow unsatisfactory. It depends, right? So this is also the, the thing where engineering knowledge becomes important, right? Although we have a data-driven kind of framework around reinforcement learning, this is an important question to evaluate if the state information which we can make available to the agent is complete 
in the information state context or not. So if we work with a physical system, the information is, is the state space which is available in my measurements a complete picture of this physical system or are some information missing in order to give the agent a complete picture? And this is, of course, where you need engineering knowledge about the specific system, right? So if you want to do the swing up problem with the card pole, this system has four states. X position, velocity in X direction, angle, and angular velocity, right? Four states. If your agent has access to all four states by measurements devices, information state. If one of these information points are missing, so let's say you are not able to, to read the speed or something like that, this would become a non-Markov state because some of the information is missing. Surat. Um, if you have noisy information, that is not a problem in general. Because, um, as we see here, we consider this state probabilities, and within those probabilities, of course, noise is implicitly covered. Yes. And that's a pretty good question how we interpret disturbances. Um, we could interpret it with different viewpoints. So we could interpret that the disturbance could have be some um, impulse like disturbance, right? And the impulse disturbance will basically just the state transition. And if the state transition already happened, the disturbance is basically already vanished, right? Um, of course, if there is an external disturbance which would continuously act on the system, then we would need to somehow measure this disturbance or make it available to the agent because otherwise the information picture is not complete, right? So yeah, good question. So disturbances, if they are relevant to our system, then they need to be accessible or modeled because they will, of course, have influences on the system. Or likely, if this disturbance can be part of this transition model, right? So if you say, okay, it's, it's somehow like a stochastic process, this disturbance, then we can consider it as part of this transition state probabilities. If it's somehow a deterministic issue, then of course it would need to be modeled. Okay. I've also brought two very simple examples of uh, models with Markov states. I hope every one of you knows them. State space models, so the name already says it's somehow a uh, Markov state. And of course, um, the state space model from the viewpoint of the agent only becomes an information state problem if this measurement equations here in the nonlinear case and in the linear case are such that we have direct access to the states, right? If the measurements equations, so the, the last two sets of equations here, would indicate that we do not have direct access to all states, then of course this observations, this y, would be not an information state observation of the system. It would be incomplete. And in this case, what we will need is, we will need the parsed information in this case. That is basically the big difference. If you have direct access to all states, then just the last state information is sufficient. If you do not have access to all states, then you also need to consider the parsed information to build something what in control engineering we call an estimator or an observer. So for most machine learning engineers, or scientists, which are not coming from the control field, they look on this problem like, oh my gosh, I do not have full state information. But the control engineer says, okay, but you maybe have a model, at least a rough model, so you can utilize this model, build an estimator, build an observer, done. So very good to be an engineer and not a data scientist. Very good. <laughs> okay, 
So therefore, important information, information state or not. Um, this, of course, is directly linked to the uh, observability problem. Um, agent directly measures full environments. So what I've meant here is all states are directly accessible by our measurement. Then we have a Markov decision process. And if we only have partial observability, where from the agent point of view, we would not have an information state problem, where only, for example, parts of the states are made available by measurements, then what we receive is a so-called partial observable Markov decision process. We will also go in more details on this next week, shortly POMDP, which basically means that we have to reconstruct the state information by some estimator or observer. However, the good thing is, in class, we will only consider the simple case. <laughs> so this is Outlook for you guys. We will have maybe a short Outlook at the very last lecture in 14, 15 weeks from now for uh, PMDP problems. Um, however, the baseline I can tell you already right now is solving this is straightforward. Solving this needs to um, some additional more work. For example, as I said, an estimator, which could be an explicit estimator, like an observer or estimator, or later on we will work with re, uh, artificial neural networks as function approximators. And artificial neural network can also have recurrency, right? Recurrent artificial neural networks, like long short-term memories you might already have heard. We can also utilize these recurrent properties of these kinds of networks to build something like an implicit observer. But we will come to this later. What are PMD examples? The ugly examples, so technical systems with limited sensors, where one sensor fails or is cut down for costs. Poker game, of course, also. A poker game, if you consider what is the state of a poker game. Yeah, your hand, of course, is part of the problem, but also the hands of the others in the game are part of the problem, right? If they have better cards than you, you have a problem. Uh, but normally, in most cases, <laughs> you should not know what your opponent has on the end, right? Except you might have some good mirrors placed in the, in the game hall or something like that. But therefore, poker game would be a POMDP because you do not know what your opponent has. And human health status would be an example for a system which is so complex that you do not really know what information you would need to describe the human in his health status as a complete information state. So these would be PMDP problems. But as I said, except for an outlook at the very last lecture, we will consider this part. So this is very important that from now on, basically, for the next 14, 15 weeks, we will always consider that we have full access to all states. And this is a severe simplification. And that's a severe assumption, right? Because from these simple examples, and we can add many more examples to it, it should become clear that this is a very yeah, important assumption, very hard assumption, and many real-world problems will not be MDP problems, but PUMDP problems. So therefore, it's very important that you have this assumption in the back of your mind. And when you approach a reinforcement learning problem or optimal decision-making problem, get back in your mind, have a view on the system which you're interacting with and ask yourself, do I have access to all states which are important to describe the status of the system? If yes, okay. If no, either make up your mind how you can retrieve full access or you need to know that we are in this PMDP problem. Okay, we have discussed states and rewards. Actions are missing. So actions is basically what the agent has as the degree of freedom. So this is basically our choice, our degree of freedom, which our agent or we as our replica of the agent can choose. And we can also distinct many properties of actions. The first distinction would be what I call finite action set and continuous action set that comes a little bit from the control engineering domain. A very simple finite action set means that we have a set of finite discrete number of actions. Like for example, if I'm in a mini grid problem, I can maybe just go right, I can go left, I can go forward, I can go backwards. So I would have four actions, right? That's a finite set of actions. Right, left, backward, forward. 
And the thing is, if I have finite actions, I can normally summarize information about this actions and the consequences in tables, right? Because I only need to store information about a finite set of actions from my previous actions and from my past actions. That is something which I can put in a table and evaluate this table to find better decisions, which we will do through the course. If we have continuous action sets, so let's say I can freely move in this space, so I can not only go left, right, backward and forward, but I can basically go everywhere with infinite, infinitesimal small steps and infinitesimal small angle deviations in this two-dimensional space, then I have a continuous action set. Or in other words, I have infinitely many options what to do next. And infinitely many options means we have a problem space, a decision space, which is infinitely large. And it's, that's a bad thing, right? If we have infinitely many decisions, uh, that's much harder to choose between infinitely many and just four. So therefore, we will do the continuous action set stuff later in the course when it comes to learning based on function approximators because we will basically use artificial neural networks to try to map somehow this infinitely large space by some function approximator. So therefore, we will leave this for later. Um, the actions can be, of course, deterministic or random. We will discuss that also throughout the course. And there might be also constraints on the actions, um, which we will also discuss later on today. Some examples, so taking a card in blackjack, so either stick or hold, would be a classical finite action set. They only have two actions, right? Stick or hold, so taking another card or basically ending the game. Uh, drive an autonomous card, a continuous action set, of course, we have infinitely many steering opportunities and acceleration opportunities. Uh, buying stock options for trading portfolio is actually uh, somehow a hybrid problem. Why it's a hybrid problem? Because the number of stocks which you can acquire is normally a discrete value, like one stock share, two stock shares, three stock shares. But the time when you buy them, of course, is somehow like a continuous kind of thing. So this would be like hybrid. And therefore, the remark here is also if you approach a new reinforcement learning problem, one of the first things is not only that you consider, do you have an information state problem, so POMDP or MDP problem, but also what are your problem spaces? Do you have finite actions, continuous actions? Do you have also finite space states or continuous states? And depending on this combination, you will need to pick the correct solution algorithms later on. So these are basically sanity checks, which you need to do at the very beginning. What problem do I have? Okay, with the action, there's also linked very closely the policy. The policy is the agent's internal strategy of picking actions, which can be deterministic. So we have a function pi giving a state xk, applying an action uk, right? So if I want to move from here to the door in order to leave the room, my state would be, I'm here in this position, this would be my x of k. And then my policy, my pi, would be, okay, I want to go left. Left, and after a couple of steps, I'm out and say goodbye. Okay? So this would be my policy, a mapping from state to action. And as this is only depending on my current action, this is already implying that this is an information state, right? because I do not consider the history of states, but just my recent state information. That could be, of course, also stochastic, so no need to model a policy just in a deterministic way. There could be also some probability giving an action, mapping towards an act, uh, giving a state, mapping towards an action, right? So that could be also some kind of probability in that sense that, um, some kind of randomness to actions can be also beneficial, for example, 
going back to poker, if you always do the same thing in poker, your opponent will know what you're doing, right? So having a deterministic, in other words, predictable strategy can be in some problems be not so good because then, especially if you have some kind of opponent problem, you get predictable and that can be a bad thing. And of course, reinforcement learning is everything about changing this policy pi in such a way that we can maximize the expected return, right? So this is our reward hypothesis. We want to maximize the long-term series of rewards. And our degree of freedom in order to achieve this goal is to play around with pi, right? So simple example of my policy to leave this room through the door would be a policy where I first go right, so going more away from the, from the target door, that would be a bad thing, right? So I want to improve my policy over time that I can learn that it's the fastest way to directly approach to the door. And this would be then changing the policy. Here's some examples for policies. Um, that would be a very classical example from control engineering, deterministic policy, a classical PID controller. Um, so a controller in this classical form can be considered a reinforcement learning agent. Here the task could be, for example, to do some tracking task where here the reference minus the uh, current value of the observables should be minimized in a quadratic sense. And our gains, KP, KR, KD for this PID controller would be the parameters of our policy. And therefore, if we uh, also set up here our environmental state as the state of the output here of the plant plus a reference, then the controller action is the policy giving our current state, including the reference, such that we want to shape KP, KI, KD, such that the next control action at this point is such taken that this error is minimized over time, right? So this would be a classical control engineering kind of problem. Choose the controller parameters in such a way that you can do tracking of the references. And this would be basically a reinforcement learning problem. And your agent would be parameterized by these three parameters. What could be a deterministic uh, problem here? Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock game. More or less the same thing as I've mentioned with poker. If you are predictable in a game where you have an active opponent and your moves become predictable slash deterministic, the guy will really take you off. And if you have some randomness, for example, a uniform random policy where your next move is completely random and unpredictable, this would at least give you some chance. And uh, that can be then also analyzed more deeply with game theory, which of course we do not do here. But this at least gives you hopefully an, another intuition where um, stochastic policies can be beneficial in order to in, increase the return. However, we will also see later on that stochastic policies can be good in order to learn something. Why? If you only do always the same thing, right? So if you do not try out something new, you will just stay in, what, in, the, in the policy what you're doing all the time, right? So you need to do new moves, you need, to new, you need to try out new things in order to learn something. And a stochastic policy where your next controller action is basically a distribution around possibilities, of course around this random impact, then you will learn something because you do new things over time. So therefore, stochastic policies can also have uh, advantages in terms of learning, but we will come to this also during the course. Okay. So basically now we have discussed more or less all elements again of our reinforcement learning loop, state, actions, rewards, agent, policy. And from this, what I would like to introduce now as more or less a last formal definition for today are so-called value functions. The value functions are the two functions beside these basic elements like state, rewards, actions, policy, agent, and environment, 
which are the central solution elements of every, of every reinforcement learning problem. There will be no reinforcement learning problem which will not utilize value function. So what is the value function? There are two of them. The first one is called the state value function. We call this v of pi. And what is v of pi? That is basically something which we have already uh, defined previously. This is basically the return, right? So the series of discounted rewards, right? Series of discounted rewards under the policy pi. So we take actions following a specific policy pi. And this state value function is associated with the state which I'm currently in. So it's basically a performance value indicating if I'm currently in this state, how good or how bad is that in the long term, right? So it's basically the central performance metric to evaluate how good or how bad it is to be in a certain state. That could be, for example, your stock market portfolio value, right? So what do you expect to have for a stock market value in the long term with your current stock market trading portfolio? Or in the context of leaving this room, my goal would be, okay, I want to leave this room. If I'm being in this state, in the middle of the room, the state value here would be, of course, smaller in contrast to a state value where I've already moved one step to the next state closer to my goal, right? So state value describing I'm in a state, how good or how bad is that state? And this helps me to order different states in terms of their usefulness uh, with respect to my object. Then I have a similar thing, um, the so-called state action value, or sometimes just short called action value. We introduce this with this number Q, with this uh, letter Q, and Q is basically more or less similar to the state value, but the state action value now also takes into account not only the state information, but also the action. So it basically is also the same idea. It's a performance metric. I'm in the state here in X, and it, I do a specific action going left, going right. How good or how bad is that? Right? So it combines the state with the action information and makes a performance evaluation. Right? So if I'm standing here and I want to leave the room, my state action value of going one step left of course, would be a better one in comparison to one step right, because if my objective is to leave this room, going an action towards the room exit is beneficial in contrast to going a step towards the opposite direction, right? And now comes the interesting thing. If we are in a discrete action space, so if these actions here are a limited number of opportunities, like going forward, backward, right, and left, if we know this function, if somebody tells you like this function for a specific problem, then you have already found your solution. Why? If you can evaluate this function just for a finite number of options, I can just compare these finite number of options and choose this option which gives me the highest action value because it indicates that this action, this decision, will deliver me the highest discounted future reward. And therefore, the state action value, or as well as the state value, are the most important performance metrics in order to make optimal decisions because they carry the information about optimality. And reinforcement learning will basically cover different viewpoints, different methods, how to learn these functions based on data. Because if you want, going back to our stabilization problem, if you want to learn how to stabilize the pendulum, 
nobody gives you these state value functions, right? You just have a pendulum and you can interact with this pendulum. And you need to learn this from interacting with the system and learning these functions. And we will cover how to learn these functions from interacting with a true system. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. So key task is estimating these two functions because they basically carry the solution of the problem. Then the last slide for the basic terminology, exploration and exploitation. That is basically um, the thing which I've already mentioned with the stochastic policies. So um, what is exploration is to try out something new, right? So if you do a new move, you can learn something in contrast to what you did in the past. Exploitation is the opposite from this. Exploitation means giving your current information which you have obtained from interacting with the environment, what do you think is the best possible move you can make now? So exploitation would be try to make the best out of what you know so far. And exploration would be I am willing to sacrifice some reward now in order to learn something about the system such that I'm able to make better decisions in the long term. And that's a dilemma which you maybe face every day. Or not maybe, you will face it every day like this robot. Let's say this robot wants to go to a restaurant and uh, the robot is new to town. So if you're new to town, you need to, of course, explore different restaurants to see what you like or what you dislike. However, after some time, the problem maybe occurs that, you know, okay, I will leave town in a few days because my holiday is going to come to an end. So the question is, okay, I have already visited a few of restaurants and I know I like, like these restaurants I like very much. But there may be also restaurants which I did not visit yet, and I don't know if these are bad or good restaurants. So you have like an exploration, exploitation dilemma. Based on your previous restaurant's visit, should you go to these restaurants which you already liked very much, or should you take the risk trying out something new? And that's a dilemma. There's no ideal solution for it. It's a uh, a really tricky thing. And the interesting thing that here with this restaurant kind of problem, cartoonic problem, this is a key problem of every reinforcement learning issue because also in control engineering, if you want to learn how to, again, stabilize this pendulum, you need to explore, giving a certain state of the system, is it good to push this cart a little bit left or right or what you do with your control action? and you need to explore, but if you explore all the time, you will not exploit the information which you already have at hand. And to find a good compromise, a good trade-off between exploration and exploitation is really a tricky thing. And I would say this is another time, more like an art than in science, that you need to find a good compromise. The same as with the reward function, there's also no huge scientific way how to formalize these reward functions, but you need to get some uh, experience from this. So exploration, exploitation dilemma, a central concept in reinforcement learning, which we will utilize and discuss a lot during the lecture. Yeah, a model. Uh, a model is something which we also will basically just ignore for most of the time. Not most of the time, but um, yeah, for a large share. What could be a model? One model could be a state transition model. So being in a state X, applying an action U, what would be the next state? That was like our state space model, right? So we are in a state and we are applying a controller action. Where will I be in the next state? That would be a state-driven model. The state space models, which we have seen before, had been deterministic models. Here we consider this as some random model or a stochastic model with some probability distributions. Or we can also consider a reward model that giving the state X, applying an action U, what will be the reward based on this state action combination? That might be also random, right? Think back of our uh, helicopter problem. So you steer a helicopter, you want to fly a maneuver and suddenly a wind gust is pushing you into a tree or something. And of course, 
in the one time the reward will be very bad when the wind really pushes you heavily against something and the helicopter will break. In the other time where those wind gusts may be not so heavily present, you will survive and the reward will be better. Okay? So therefore, we might also have a reward model. So models can be stochastic or deterministic. We have discussed that. And normally, and that is a nice thing about reinforcement learning, in most of the cases, we will see that we will not need these models. So most reinforcement learning algorithms, the classical ones, are considered model-free algorithms. We will also discuss briefly at some points model-based algorithms where you need model knowledge in order to make informed decisions. But the interesting thing about reinforcement learning is that we do not need them. We can learn from interaction. We can learn from data, which does not require you to have this as a priori information. Of course, there are interesting hybrid approaches where you use data in order to fit such models. And then you can also utilize the models in order to learn from them. This would be then a hybrid approach also using system identification, but we will also discuss this briefly. Okay, so any questions so far to our basic elements of reinforcement learning? That would have been state, action, reward, policy, exploration, exploitation, dilemma, and model. Seems to be clear. Good. So these will be the, the problem space or the, the, the ingredients of which we will utilize in the problem space. And now I would like to briefly discuss with you the main categories on reinforcement learning problem solving algorithms. Um, just to give you a very brief intuition, we will go in details in the next weeks on these different algorithm categories. These are just the categories, not the solution, but the categories to give you some intuition. How can we solve this decision problem? To do this, I utilize here the example from David Silver. I find this a very nice example, uh, a maze example. So what is the problem? We start here at the starting state and we want to reach this goal state, of course, as quick as possible. That is the objective. Um, we get a reward of minus one. So that means the longer we will stay in the maze, the worse the accumulated reward. Uh, we have an episodic problem. So when you reach the goal state, the episode is recached. Actions are simple. Four-dimensional action space, left, right, top, and down. Uh, state, of course, is just the agent locations. That will be an information state, and it's also considered a deterministic problem. No stochastic influence. That is a problem, a so-called maze problem or mini-grid problem. And um, in reinforcement learning, we have basically three, three and a half uh, opportunities on how to solve this on a high level. The first solution method would be a so-called policy-based method. What do I refer to this? That basically means that in every state, so in every position of my maze, I define an explicit action. So if I'm here, I want to go left. If I'm here, I want to go up, and so on. So for every state, we define an explicit action. That would be the policy-based solution. I don't tell you yet how we learn this, but this would be just a way how the final result look like. So we have a policy saying to us in every state, do this. Very intuitive, right? So somebody just tell you do this and you do it. Very nice. Second approach would be the value-based solution. Again, I don't tell you how we get there, but just from the concept. So value-based, in contrast to policy-based, where it tells you basically, okay, if you're here, go there. If you're here, go there. Value-based would be something like an indirect solution, right? The value, what was the value? The value was like an information about the usefulness of being in a certain state, the advantage of being in a certain state. And therefore, 
let's say you are here at this state, at this position, and you do solution by value based algorithms, then what you would do is you would need to compare the surrounding states, this state, this state, and this state, and look for the next successor state which has the best value. Right? In this case, for obvious reasons, if you are here, you would see that the state upwards, minus 14, is better than minus 16 and minus 16. So a value-based solution would require like a one-step prediction. It's not like explicitly telling you you are in the state, do this. But it basically tells you if you go there, this will be better than going there or there. So same solution, but somehow different implementation. So value-based solution. Here the policy is only implicitly available by comparing the values of different actions. And last but not least, that is a model-based solution, which we will consider only uh, rarely in the reinforcement learning context. Model-based basically means you have a model of your maze, this would be an example model of the maze, which, if you compare it to our initial maze, is different, right? So it would be an incomplete model, it would be an inaccurate model, because here it would be basically even a false reward, indicating that if you are here, you would get a reward of minus 4, which is not in line with our actual problem environment, where you get a reward always of minus 1. So the model might be inaccurate, it might be incomplete, but the idea is now with model-based that you utilize this model and throw many, many solution candidates in terms of action sequences against this model. And once you think that you have found an optimal solution by just interacting with the model, not with the real physical system, but just with the model of the system, then you do your controller action. So that would be like a planning kind of problem where your decisions are not coming from real-world data, where they are not coming from an explicit policy, but from a virtual interaction with the model. And this is basically what we will see just in the, in the last subtopic for today. That would be what, from a control point of view, we would call model predictive control or optimal control in that sense that from our current point of view we do take a complete prediction trajectory towards the future trying to find not only our next controller action but an entire trajectory of controller actions right in reinforcement learning we have this loop and the loop basically said to us in every time step we just do one step and then come to the next controller decision. Here, this model-based problem in the context of model predictive control is different. It basically tells us we try to solve the entire trajectory from here to end and then plan along this trajectory. And therefore, this very nice scheme here, reinforcement learning agent taxonomies, that is where we will basically work in. We will start with value-based solutions because they're easier to compute. Then later on, we will come up to policy-based solutions, eventually with hybrid solutions, which are called vector-critic solutions. Both of these domains, together with the hybrid uh, fusion vector-critic methods, are so-called model-free methods because we do not need any model. We can just learn from experience. And then as a yeah, side topic, model-based reinforcement learning, we will discuss it briefly throughout the next weeks. Okay? Takeaway message here basically for you is we have different opportunities in reinforcement learning to solve the same problem. And the main three categories are either explicit policy, implicit value function-based, or planning-based with a model. These are the three categories. And the classical two, which we will consider mostly, are these two top ones, because they are data driven. Any questions to that so far? Yeah.
problem with valuation is that I model on how the process is going to value something. The value comes through existing model evaluation. Yeah, so good question. Where's the difference between the value function and the model based thing, right? So with the value function based thing, you only would do like a one step ahead prediction, one step ahead planning. So as I said, if you are here, you would look in the surrounding and choose the controller action, which seems to be best in terms of the value. And within this value function, all the information is already saved regarding the next steps or the usefulness of being in the state. So the value is basically therefore some kind of information metric which has the information about the long-term consequences being in the state. The planning approach in contrast where we do not have the value for all the different states, there you do not need to do only one-step predictions but basically long-term predictions over the entire state space to basically calculate the value function due to this rollout, due to this prediction of the future, right? So it's basically very similar, but the value function-based approach would be we try to learn from data the value of being in a certain state, and the model-based part would be if we are in a certain state, we utilize the model and plan ahead. And value-based would be, we have been in, a, in the state already in the past. Based on our period experience data, we estimate that the value of the states around us is so and so big. Right? So it's more like something like backwards looking, utilizing past data, and forward looking, utilizing a model to plan ahead into the future. But if you would have an exact model, so let's say if this model would be exact, of course what you could do is you could calculate the value by planning ahead and then the value would be the same value, however you would have obtained it in a forward planning fashion and not in a backward data-driven evaluation fashion. Good. For this reason I've also put just two or three slides um, to a small comparison to model predictive control because our department is basically like a control engineering department and I find that it is important to highlight some similarities and there are actually many similarities between model predictive control and reinforcement learning but also some distinct deviations which might have consequence for when to choose what method in order to solve certain problems. So uh, model predictive control um, is basically this part, this planning, which we have just discussed. So we take model of our environment and we plan into the future. And reinforcement learning, as mentioned, is we do not have a model of our environment. We just use data from the past by interacting with the environment and try to make better decisions for the future. However, therefore, planning with respect to model predictive control and reinforcement learning are basically targeting the same thing, right? We want to make optimal decisions in our environment. So same case. However, we try to reach these optimal decision-making policies in two different extreme scenarios. With reinforcement learning, we basically just learn from data obtained from the system. So that means if you have any pre-knowledge about the system, in a classical reinforcement learning algorithm, you would not utilize it. You just would use data by interacting with the system, which might be somehow, you know, freaky if you're like an engineer knowing already, for example, the dynamics of this pendulum. You might be able to use some uh, Lagrangian Euler kind of uh, method in order to derive the first order dynamics of this model, which you have learned hopefully in the bachelor's, then of course you could utilize this model in order to add some information on how to do the swing up and stabilization. However, in classical reinforcement learning, there is no room for this because you just learn from interacting with the system and you have to throw away all your pre-knowledge, which is a very nice finding after having studied six, seven, 
semesters of engineering, and then I come and say, okay, you can now forget everything. <laughs> Not very motivated. On the other thing, planning, so model predictive control, would be quite the contrary. We just use our model, plan ahead, and we would not consider past observations on how good or how bad this control was, right? This would be also somehow like idiotic, right? So we have a model which might not be accurate. We might also have some other limitations. We do plan ahead, we do controller actions, we find out that this controller actions for obvious reasons have not been ideal, the pendulum is, you know, flipping back and is not nicely stabilized and things like that. We should utilize then the data saying to us, okay, that was not ideal in order to improve ourselves. In classical planning slash model predictive control, that is not happening. You just use your model plan ahead and that's it. And therefore, at some cases, during the course, we will try to breach the barrier between these two domains and trying to use learning aspects based on data and planning aspects based on pre-knowledge in order to fuse them, right? Because I feel that this is quite intuitive. If you have knowledge about the system, use it. If you learn something more about the system during the interaction with the system, use it at least. And I cannot present a mathematical proof of this, but from engineering into addition, using both seems to be a quite good idea. However, this course will be focusing more on the model-free part. From time to time, we will discuss planning parts, but I just would like to yeah, make you aware of this difference and of potential consequences. Um, planning in terms of model predictive control also looks very familiar to us because reinforcement um, model predictive control is basically having the same hypothesis. We want to find optimal controller actions, but in model predictive control, from who of you, by the way, already had model predictive control actions? I see some. One, two, three, four, well, not so many, okay. <laughs> Okay, but then, okay, most of you need to believe me that if you write down a model predictive controller approach, uh, that looks like the same. The only thing is that this reward is not a reward anymore, but costs. And instead of maximizing something, we do minimizing. Okay, instead of maximizing something positive, we minimize something negative. That's exactly the same. Okay, so the cost function is basically the reward hypothesis in reinforcement learning. So model predictive control and reinforcement learning in terms of the objective is identical. No different. Um, we can do this also on finite uh, horizon kind of thing where our look ahead is limited, which we normally need to do in practical applications because if you plan ahead, the more steps you plan ahead, the more complex the planning problem, so therefore, in technical problems, normally we need to limit ourselves to NP steps in order to limit the computational complexity. And uh, therefore, just from this, uh, from this cost function, which can be solved together with a model in the background, I hope it becomes clear that in terms of the objective model predictive control and reinforcement learning is basically the same. The only difference is now that with model predictive control, as I said, we do not utilize the past as in reinforcement learning to learn something, but we utilize the model to plan ahead within the so-called prediction horizon. And the two other differences between the concepts are that we have a model, which we do not have in reinforcement learning, and very importantly, we are able to consider constraints. That is very important in terms of technical problems. So if you play a game, you can do whatever you want, right? If you do something wrong, you will lose the game, and that's it. If you drive a car, and you do something wrong, not so good, right? Somebody will suffer, either you or somebody else. So therefore, in technical applications, you want to consider different constraints. State constraints like do not hit the tree, 
or action constraints like do not accelerate too fast because you will lose controllability about your car. These constraints in model predictive control can be nicely integrated because in model predictive control we have this forward planning kind of way. So we can consider with our model and the constraint knowledge that we only take actions which are within these constraints. In reinforcement learning, we do not have something like that. We just have the reward. The reward is telling us that was good or bad. Right? So in bare reinforcement learning, we have to hit the tree at least once to see that this was there until you hit it again and again and again. Then you can learn from hitting the tree, okay, it was not so good to hit the tree with your car because you get negative reward. But of course, this tree will then have suffered a lot and your car has also suffered a lot, which is normally not a good combination. And this is really the biggest thing about reinforcement learning and technical problems, that you do not have an explicit entry point where you can smooth in constraints. You have to learn from heart that something was really going wrong by an implicit constraint saying that the reward is going down to the seller. Which also motivates to fusion planning and learning aspects together. Okay, a little uh, last slide for today, a uh, comparison between the two principles, um, which are basically having the same target, sequential optimal decision making. The objectives are basically, you know, more or less the same. Minimize the cost, maximize the return is identical. A priori model, we need that for model predictive control because we need to plan ahead. For reinforcement learning, we will see throughout the course that this is not a bit required. So this is, of course, an also interesting. Um, in one of the application examples, I've mentioned that um, Reinforcement learning last year has been used in order to control a nuclear fusion reactor, right? So the interesting thing about nuclear fusion reactors is that they have some models, but they are not so pretty accurate because there are not so many nuclear fusion reactors yet available in the entire world. So what they have done is they have basically used MPC in practical words to pre-learn a reinforcement learning agent and then use that agent to control the fine-tuning kind of part with model-free interaction by directly interacting with the real reactor, which then basically allowed the reinforcement learning agents to learn the details. So there are many opportunities where you can combine both things together. Pre-knowledge integration, of course, if you have pre-knowledge, you want to use it. It's easy in MPC because you can put it into the model. In reinforcement learning rather complex. We will discuss that throughout the lecture. Constraint handling, we have discussed that regarding safety, MPC, it's possible. Reinforcement learning, you have to hit the tree. Adaptivity, also interesting. In reinforcement learning, as I said, that is an inherent concept of reinforcement learning. You will adapt the controller policy all the time. In MPC, you need add-ons. Why? If you have a model, Normally, this model is set in stone. If you want to change the model, you need to have some add-on algorithm which allows you to adapt the model by system identification slash supervised machine learning. Online complexity, this is more like for implementing the stuff in real-world applications. Um, there, one can debate forever what is more computational demanding. It really depends on the application. I can say that if you discuss both with industry partners, they will run away because in most industries, both are not yet utilized. Um, MPC and reinforcement learning, they're normally used for heuristic controller designs. So therefore, online complexity in these machine learning kind of approaches are, is always a, a problem, always a concern, which needs to be addressed. And stability theory, for example, for our pendulum, of course, with MPC, this is classical control theory, where very mature st stable stability proofs and in reinforcement learning there is yeah uh, not so much available 
Okay, so that was my really my last slide. I skipped the summary. The summary is more like for you as the last slide for if you go through the slides at home again. So you don't go through the summary slides during my lectures because you have been here the last three hours something. Um, so you don't need to get a summary right now. That's more for you at home. Uh, but I hope with this comparison, you should have at least get a good intuition where the similarities and differences between reinforcement learning and model predictive control are. Um, having said that, there's also a model predictive control class, <laughs> which you can visit. Uh, this semester, it's more like a self-learning class due to uh, some reasons. But um, I hope that I could motivate you that blending in the two approaches can be really interesting. However, of course, we will focus on this part throughout the next 14 appointments.